Good morning. I want to welcome you to Rooftop on this wonderful morning. Family members, friends who came for the uh, dedications, we are glad to have you with us and hope that you are blessed uh, in your time here. If you're a guest with us here at Rooftop, I want to welcome you again. Thank you for the effort it took to be here this morning to join us. Uh, I do want to encourage you to fill out that blue card that you have and especially the first-time guest box that's there on the front. We would love to follow up with a little note and a gift saying thank you. Place that in the offering as it comes by a little later in the service. Well, before we begin, I just want to share a couple things. I'm a little nervous, believe it or not, with regard to our morning's topic and our discussion. And uh, so I appreciate your prayers, even as I'm here, just because of the nature of the discussion. But I also want to cite several pastors, teachers who I was watching and, and listening to try to address this issue as wisely and effectively as possible. So Matt Chandler, Louis Giglio, David Platt, all have contributions to my message here today, and I just want to cite them ahead of time uh, for that. So let's begin. On Wednesday, March 18th, just a week and a half ago, a woman named Michelle Wilkins of Longmont, Colorado, was responding to a Craigslist ad posted by Dinell Lane in which she was selling baby clothes. Michelle, who was seven months pregnant, was just doing what expecting mothers do to get ready for the arrival of her daughter. However, once she arrived at Lane's home to take a look at the advertised clothes, she was at attacked and subdued by Lane. While unconscious, Lane, who had some medical experience as a nurse's aide, cut open Michelle's stomach and removed the baby from her womb. Then Lane, who for some time had been lying to her husband that she was pregnant, took the baby to their home put her, the baby, in the bathtub, and when her husband came home shortly thereafter, told him that she had miscarried, and her husband, supposedly not knowing at all what was going on, completely su surprised by the affair, drove her and the baby to the hospital where the baby girl was pronounced dead. When Michelle Wilkins regained consciousness from the assault and saw that her stomach had been cut, she called 911. Police and medical personnel were able to find her hiding for her life in a room in the basement of the house where she had been assaulted. Rushed to the hospital and in critical condition for a time, she did stabilize. And then a week later, this past Thursday, was released to recover at home. Now, as you can imagine, the outcry of sympathy and support for Michelle Wilkins from all who hear about this and justice for her now deceased baby girl has been enormous. And what justice might there be for Michelle Wilkins' baby girl? Well, over the past couple decades, 38 of 50 states have passed laws that protect the unborn in such a criminal act as this. However, Colorado is not one of those states. It is one of the 12 states that does not have fetal protection law. In fact, in 2013, the Colorado State Legislature voted against fetal protection law, fearing that the law might in some way hinder abortion access and abortion rights in the state of Colorado. The pro-abortion lobby is strong in the state of Colorado and has worked effectively to prevent these types of laws from being passed. Friday morning when the DA announced, just this past Friday, when the DA announced the numerous charges against Lane, Murder was not on the list because Colorado does not recognize the unborn baby as a living person, including the 34 weeks developed baby girl of Michelle Wilkins. Now, what this story reveals, chilling as the details are, is that the issue of abortion in this country is volatile, emotional, and polarizing. And that's something any of us who know about it have known for some time. But the ongoing battle over abortion in this case will protect Dinell Lane from a much more severe consequence for her actions if found guilty of the charges leveled against her. And this battle denies Baby Wilkins the justice that many, many people believe she deserves. And this is what we're here to talk about this morning. Breathe. We're finishing up our series called We've Got Issues here at Rooftop, and for the past couple of months, we've been looking at 
all sorts of issues across the spectrum that are in the news and that we deal with on a day-to-day basis. And this week, we're finishing up with the issue of abortion. Now, it has been and is this morning our hope to look into the scriptures, to find out what God might have to say to us regarding this this issue and every issue that we have covered. And we believe through his word and through his spirit who is present in us as his followers and for us as a church will give us guidance with regard to this issue. And while it doesn't get a ton of coverage in the mainstream media, you may not have heard about that event. When compared to Ferguson or mysterious plane crashes, Abortion is one of the most volatile and consequential issues in American society and in our world today. There have been 55 million legal abortions in our country since 1973 when abortion was legalized throughout the country. It's averaging 1.3 million a year. Abortion is also common around the world. And in a country like China, for instance, abortion is in many cases forced upon the mother or chosen widely by families in China in order to ensure the birth of a son and not a daughter because of China's one-child policy, the abort because of gender. Compared to the 55 million abortions the U.S. has had over the last 40 years, China reports having performed 336 million abortions over that same period of time. Now, I want to stop and ask for grace. Just take a moment to stop and request grace because this is a volatile, emotional, and polarizing issue. And it's not something that we normally talk about. In fact, this is Rooftop's first ever abortion-centric message in 14 years of existence. Whatever your personal experiences, and there may be people in this room who have had an abortion, who have encouraged someone to have an abortion, wherever your position on the issue or your feelings, whether for or against, I ask you and invite you to pray with me in a spirit of grace that we might listen and journey over the next 25 to 30 minutes and consider what God might have to say to each of us and then also what God might have to say to all of us as a church body. Father, we ask for your help. We ask for wisdom. I just ask that you would uh, be present here. We pray that you would shut my mouth with regard to the things that I would want to say. And I pray that you would speak the things that you would want to say. Uh, And work in each of our hearts in accordance with your will for our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what is abortion? Well, as you can imagine, even the definition of abortion is debated heavily because of all the terms and the details that are are so intricate to the the stakes of the issue. But Merriam-Webster, ironically, I think gives the most complete definition, and it defines abortion as this. It's the termination of a pregnancy after, accompanied by, resulting in, or closely followed by the death of the embryo or fetus, or unborn baby, for those of us who believe it is, in fact, a baby. The two extreme Positions on the issue range from abortion being legal and available and covered by health care at any and all points in a woman's pregnancy to the other side of the view, the the extreme pro-life position that would say that it is their objective to eliminate abortion completely regardless except maybe the most, most extreme circumstances, life of the baby, mother, that type of thing. The pro-abortion and the pro-choice position is this. It contends that a woman's right to choose an abortion should, be, should not be limited by governmental or religious authority, and it outweighs any right claimed for an embryo or fetus. They say that pregnant women will resort to unsafe illegal abortions if there is no legal option. In 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court declared abortion to be a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. In the decades prior to that, abortion was illegal and women who sought them were forced into dangerous situations in order to try to get one. Once deciding, it became legal in all 50 states, provided that there were certain medical conditions that were present in order to protect the life of the mother from these dangerous circumstances. Also, Pro-abortion, pro-choice advocates would say that reproductive choice empowers women by giving them control over their own bodies. 
After centuries of subjugation and misogynistic oppression, abortion affirms the rights of women which are long overdue and should be complete and unfettered with regard to their reproductive rights. Third, pro-abortion, pro-choice advocates say personhood begins after a fetus becomes viable. That means able to survive outside the womb or after birth, not at conception. The fact that the fetus is dependent on the woman subjugates its well-being under that of the woman who is carrying it. Now, those are just three. There's many other reasons for, but those are kind of the three big ones. So I wanted to address those and share those. Then there's another view. About 10 years ago, a really popular book came on the scene called Freakonomics. Have any of you read Freakonomics or watched the documentary? I think this is interesting. Two very smart guys address the issue of abortion in their book. And they found through the latest studies and computer models and algorithms that when abortion was legalized in 1973 and crime began to significantly reduce in major metropolitan areas in the early 90s, that there was a correlation between the increase of abortion and the decrease of crime. That happened roughly 20 years later. They claim that the decrease in unwanted pregnancies could have prevented these babies from being born into and growing up in a substandard environment, which very well could have led to future delinquent and criminal behavior. Honestly, it's a very intriguing study if you're not aware of it. Now, while the authors make no moral or ethical claims regarding the information that they present, Many people have since begun to use it to affirm the benefit of abortion in building a better society. Now, I do want to note that the study was challenged on some levels by some respected sources, including the magazine The Economist. Analyzing the study, they claim that both the data and the model are incorrect, though giving the authors great credit for the effort that they did do, and thus think that their results are exaggerated and flawed. Now, the anti-abortion position or the pro-life position. They contend that personhood begins at conception, and therefore abortion is the immoral killing of an innocent human being. They say abortion inflicts suffering on the unborn child and that it is unfair to allow abortion when couples who cannot biologically conceive are waiting to adopt. The pro-life argument, in short, is abortion is murder because the killing of an innocent human being is just that and it is wrong. Life begins at conception, so unborn babies have the right to life. And that the fetus does feel pain during the abortion procedure. Now, it's not necessarily a big surprise for most of you, if you know me, that while I respect and I really do want to understand more and more the real life struggles that some women face when confronted with an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy, I do believe on many levels that abortion is wrong. And its negative impact reaches far beyond just that of the baby whose life is ended as a result. So with the remainder of our time, I want to present and take a look more closely at the pro-life issues that would lead me and would lead many of our leadership and our church to that conclusion. First, let's talk about the Freakonomics article, and what I call the dark side of Freakonomics. Now, as I stated, the study has been disputed. But even if it is correct, there are some very important ethical issues to address with regard to this, this study and this conclusion. If we conclude that society is better off because of the reduction of crime that occurred because of the increase in abortions beginning in 1973, and from that we are more likely to support abortion for these unwanted pregnancies, we have become what is called utilitarians. And, and utilitarianism is this. It has as its objective only that which is best for a society should, should happen, should occur. Whatever is best for the people, for the society at large, that is what we are going to pursue. And if you don't know, this is a very dangerous path because utilitarianism was one of the foundational principles for both Nazism and fascism. What is best for society should be the law of the land. 
Biblically speaking, God never calls his people to do what is the most efficient thing, but rather he calls his people to do the extraordinary and sacrificial acts of love and generosity, to follow the narrow path, the New Testament tells us time and again, and to reject the wide path, which leads to destruction. We need to be careful of the clever utilitarian arguments that will appeal to our human logic and our feelings at times, but are actually full of opposition to the commands of God, inherently evil at their core. So that's the Freakonomics issue I wanted to address because I've talked to people who have mentioned that and have recited that to me in this discussion. So if you have your Bibles, let's look first then next at the biblical support for life. Any biblical support goes back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we know the story. God creates the world in six days, rests on the seventh, but on the sixth day, he creates his most special creation. We learn about this in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now you can see in these two verses, three times the author tells us that we, people, human beings, are created in what? The image of God. It's called the imago Dei. And that means that we, separate from any other aspect of creation, creature, have the imprint. We are like mirrors that are capable of reflecting the very divinity of God himself. And that sets us apart from the rest of creatures and from the rest of creation. It makes us extremely special. So the question then, if we believe that to be true, and as followers of Jesus and as believers in the word, we should, when does that imago Dei happen? When does that soul begin? Well, we're given a verse in Psalm 51 that speaks of this time frame. In Psalm 51, verse 5, the author speaking makes this statement. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, this is not a good thing necessarily, that we were, at the moment of conception, we were sinful. We were sinners. We were brought forth in iniquity. But what that tells us is that we had the capacity for sin in that moment. And it's the, it's the image-bearing of God that allows us to sin. No other creature on the earth, animal, can sin. They do what is in their nature. It's just what they do. We, as human agents, part of the Imago Dei, part of our soul is the ability with the power of God to follow him or the determination on our own to reject him. And we find out that at the moment of conception, the soul exists because we were conceived in iniquity. Does that make sense? If you're looking for a theological proof of the soul, it happens at that moment of conception because iniquity is present. Iniquity that we all still possess and that we all need salvation from. But it's not all bad because in Psalm 139, we get this other great passage with regard to this moment and what happens inside the womb. Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16 says the following. For you, God, form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God not only was forming, but he knew in that moment who we were to become. He knew all of the days before they happened. And then in Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, the Lord declaring his power and his sovereignty in the world says this, See now that I myself am he. There is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life I have wounded and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. God states his sovereign rule and authority over the earth 
without question in that verse and in other verses, but that one is the one. And it is God's prerogative alone as the creator to give and to take life, innocent life. In light of these, and in light of these biblical realities, it should become clearer and clearer that abortion is not just the taking of a life of the debate over is this baby fetus alive, but it is an affront to God's soul and sovereign authority as the giver and the taker of life. That raises the stakes with regard to the issue of abortion. Now, that was the biblical support. Let's look at some of the science behind the pro-life view. When Roe v. Wade decision became the law of the land, there was no 3D sonogram. There was no ability to watch our babies smile at us before they were born. In that moment we call conception, when the zygote, the one-celled person creature begins, a miracle took place. One cell from our mother merges with one cell from our father, each carrying 23 chromosomes from each parent. And when those cells merged, half of our mother's DNA merged with half of our father's DNA, and they formed a brand new DNA code that had never existed in the history of the earth. And that code was you, and it was me. Scientists have now discovered that this DNA code contains three billion character descriptions of you and of me, all in that one single cell. So if you and I began reading that three billion character description at one character per second, night and day, from now, you know how long it would take for us to learn fully about ourselves and what God has wired us within our DNA? 96 years. That's how extensive and intricate you were designed. And it's there, present, in that initial cell in the DNA. By the way, today we have billions and billions of cells that have that same code. Now, if that weren't enough, that one cell with that massive three billion long character sheet began to do the impossible. That one cell began to produce what was on the instructions. And it began to build and to create who you and I are today. One cell became two, two became four, and so on. And at eight weeks, that baby in the womb will suck their thumbs, and they believe they can respond to sound. One of the arguments for abortion is that babies in the womb feel little to no pain. Well, sonograms have shown us that when a doctor needs to draw blood or take a sample, they'll stick a needle up into the womb to do that. And the baby at eight weeks pulls its heel up and will pull it back from the needle. Pro-choice doctors say it's just reflex. Pro-life doctors believe, eh, do we want to take that chance? What if the baby begins to feel pain at that point? All the organs are functioning at eight weeks. The nervous system should be working. The nerve ending should be going back and forth from the brain at that moment. Why wouldn't pain be present. By 21 weeks, a baby with just a little help can live outside the womb. 21 weeks. It is easy to see that science and technology are revealing more and more details about the vibrancy, the vitality, and the viability of babies in the womb at all levels of development, all the way back to conception. The question of, is this, organization, is this organism inside me a human life, is being answered more loudly every year with a resounding yes. And if it is a life, then ending that life is, in fact, murder. Now, the pro-choice advocates will produce their own studies and say that there is little to no pain. But the advancing science doesn't reveal less vitality of the baby in the womb. It actually is revealing more vitality, more intricacy more vibrancy. As we see deeper and deeper into what's going on, we see more and more of the complexity and vibrancy of the unborn baby. And for those of us who acknowledge him, God, we see his indescribable work in the womb. Psalm 139, 14, which you read earlier, says this. It says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No conditions. In fact, we've seen a shift in the argument, actually. Whereas the issue and the question used to be, is abortion murder? And that still for many people is the question. Science over recent decades moving in a more vibrant and vital access to the baby 
is changing the argument. Mary Elizabeth Williams, published, who's a very uh, staunch pro-choice advocate, published an article in Salon in 2013 entitled, So What If Abortion Ends Life? That's the title of her article. And in there, she makes this statement. Yet, I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. For some abortion advocates like Williams, the debate is changing. It's not a question of whether the baby in the womb is a living person, but rather do the, lights of, do the rights of the woman carrying the baby supersede those of the baby itself? In other words, are the rights of one group of people, in this, case, in this case the mother, greater than the rights of another group of people, in this case the baby? And if so, is it so much so that one group has the right to subjugate and ultimately destroy the other group? Do you see the logical flow in that? It sounds a lot like what our country struggled with today, but more specifically, 50 years ago and prior to that. I recently saw the movie Selma. Anybody see the movie Selma? Good movie. I recommend it. I didn't know about the marches of Selma, but as I'm watching what's happening and, and the reenactment of what actually took place in the South in the 60s, I was amazed that this really was the reality of part of our country as recent as 50 years ago. 12 Years a Slave. Anybody see 12 Years a Slave? More of you. And there they do a great job revealing to us the realities of slavery, which existed as recently as 150 years ago. The subjugation of one people over another people for various reasons. As I've done this, as I've looked into this this week, I've wondered, what will people 50 years from now think about us and our either promotion of or passivity towards the issue of the unborn. As technology advances, as vitality and vibrancy continues to grow, what are people 50 years from now going to think about our generation, our society, with the millions who have been terminated? Will it be similar to how we look back at Jim Crow laws and segregation in the South, white and black water fountains, and all the other injustices that took place? 150 years from now, are people going to look at our view and passivity on the issue of abortion like we look on our ancestors 150 years ago in the South and how they enslaved actual people? These are legitimate, rational questions to consider because we get so caught up in the here and now, would we have more people abolitioning for freedom 150, 200 years ago? Then, there is the social or legal argument. The idea that a woman chooses to do with her body, that what a woman chooses to do with her body is nobody's business but her own. Now, I don't have time to draw out this point at great length, but the argument just doesn't hold up. The government and society infringes on our rights all the time, and we're glad that they do. Nobody has complete autonomy to do whatever they want with themselves. In a society, we are always having to subject our freedoms at some level to those of others within our society. You just can't put a fence up in your yard any old way. You have to put the, the, the ugly side of the fence towards you to give your neighbor preference. There are rules and laws that infringe on our freedoms and abilities all the time. You want to test it? Drive home today at 90 miles an hour with no clothes on and see what happens. Will your rights be infringed upon? Maybe, maybe not, but it's a test. There are certain things within society that society kind of agrees to, which are and are not acceptable. And if that baby is a human life, then the right of that life should supersede the hardship of the woman, and not because I'm insensitive or misogynistic and don't want to understand but because a moral and just society is built upon a commitment to protect the weak and the helpless. And if we don't, it says something about our society. I also have some personal experience with regard to this, believe it or not. 
I never expected to have to face the issue of abortion. Julie and I are both staunchly pro-life. Obviously, we've got seven children. Um, and, but in 2009, shortly after we moved here, we were pregnant with our sixth child in late about December of 2009. However, at the five, six, seven week point, at some point early on, Julie had some pain and some bleeding, and we took her to the emergency room. And they found that the baby, rather than having moved and clung to the wall of the uterus, had actually clung to the fallopian tube, what's called an ectopic pregnancy. Now, this is a problem. Because of the location, the baby doesn't have the viability and the ability to grow and develop to full term, and at some point, because of the location, the tube will most likely burst, and internal bleeding will begin, almost always causing the death of the mother. And so there, Julie and I were having to face this decision of our baby alive, growing, but in the wrong place. And while it might seem like a perfectly logical decision to come to, Making the decision to kill that baby, for Julie to take that pill that would eradicate the life of that child, seeing the poison of that pill come out in her breast milk, turning her breast milk green, and knowing that is what our baby was subjected to, still, to this day, breaks my heart. And while I haven't been there fully, having to make that decision, even though it was a, seems like a common sense decision, I got a taste of the sadness and the complexity and the reality of abortion. So I tell you, on all these levels, I believe God with all of his heart tells us to value life, to save life, to affirm life, even in the hardest of circumstances. God promises his fullness. He promises grace. He promises help. For some of us who've been there, who still deal with, though we we've, may have had an abortion or encouraged someone to do so, and we've repented and being, we've been forgiven, when those thoughts come back, we need to remember that the grace of God, that Jesus died for that purpose. He died to set us free, to forgive us. And I want to affirm that forgiveness is there. The question that we need to ask with the remainder of our time, the next five minutes or so, is this. What now? Because many of us may hold this position at some level, but if truth be known, we're very passive about it. I am very passive with regard to this issue. It wasn't just until about a year ago I finally felt God saying, Jeremy, this is real. And so I set up an appointment with Bethany Family Services, and I went and I talked and I asked questions. I began to inform myself, what are the issues? What can we do? What can be done in this? Instead of just sitting by and watching the conveyor belt move towards destruction, what can we do? And I want to recommend four things. Four things. The first, repent. Repent. If you have had, you've encouraged someone to have, you've been involved in it in some level, and you've not looked to the Lord and repented of the sin of destroying the image that he created within another human being, repent. Forgiveness is there. Grace is there. No judgment, just grace. But if you've not been involved, but you've been passive, you've been on the sidelines, you've not done much except a little moral outrage every time a certain news thing comes across or it's time to vote, maybe you get a little upset, but then you, you stop. We need to repent of our passivity. 50 years from now, 150 years from now, they're going to be asking, who stood up? Who stood in the gap? Who helped? I wish my grandparents had marched with Martin Luther King at Selma because of the evil that took place and what they were fighting against. No Zilkies in that march. I don't want to be outside the advocacy 50 years from now. So 
So we need to repent of our passivity. Two, we need to pray. Prayer is the work. Do not underestimate prayer. There are people who devote themselves out of love. I'm not talking about the adversarial people who go and and cause problems. There's just always going to be people like that because we have a fallen world. But there are people who go and put duct tape on their mouth and write life and just pray silently in front of abortion clinics, in front of the Supreme Court. There are people who go, set up booths, and with all the grace and love imaginable, they pray. They pray there. They pray in their homes. They commit to praying for our country, for the unborn, for God to come and finally change this evil. Prayer is important. We need to pray because of what it does to us. Third, we need to vote. Now, this is where it gets political. And so many people in their our political buttons, we don't want to go there. We don't want to say, it's a political issue, Jeremy. No, this issue is beyond politics. It's just fought on a political level from time to time. So don't fool yourself to thinking, it's political. I don't deal with politics. I don't have to deal with it. No, this exceeds, surpasses politics. But we do have to engage on a political level. Instead of having to fight a civil war that killed 600,000 people in Great Britain, William Wilberforce led a movement throughout his life in Great Britain to see slavery outlawed. It took him 40 plus years. But finally, he was able to abolish slavery via law. And he saved the bloodshed that our country endured because nobody was able to step up and advocate politically and bring it to an end. Wilberforce was a devout Christian and saw his role as a Christian to advocate for the African, for the slave, to guarantee them freedom in Great Britain. And this issue about being a one-issue, this kind of about being a one-issue voter. I've been called, well, you're a one-issue voter. If this is my primary issue I'm voting on, well, Jeremy, you're a one-issue voter. We're all one-issue voters. Let me share an example for you. So let's say someone comes up, male, female, probably male, because of my example, comes up and says, I can fix the debt, I can fix Medicare, I can fix Social Security, this economic danger that we're moving towards, I can fix it all. And he shows the plan, he has bipartisan support, and we believe him that he can accomplish it. And he is the perfect candidate, truly is, except for one flaw. He says, you know what? In order to do this, I'm going to have to rescind the right to vote for women and minorities. Will you and I vote for him? No, we won't. That makes you and I a one-issue voter. If the issue is important enough, it is well worth our vote. It is well worth our encouragement to get other people to vote. And then finally, advocate. We are blessed at Rooftop to have people who are advocating. We have people here who volunteer to foster parents, who look to adopt who support pregnancy resource centers, who get on the front lines. We want to thank you on behalf of Rooftop. For me, the passive observer, thank you for working and serving and sacrificing for the purpose of honoring life. And a very unique, quote-unquote, situation happened. I was invited to a Catholic prayer breakfast a couple Saturdays ago from a Catholic friend of mine who was speaking. At that prayer breakfast, I just happened to sit next to somebody named Brian Westbrook. No, not that Brian Westbrook of the Philadelphia Eagles. Brian Westbrook is a local St. Louisan who used to be an engineer, but in 2011, he quit his engineering job and he started Coalition for Life St. Louis. And it is a ministry with the purpose of advocating for the unborn. And he began to tell me in a very loving, gentle way their grace-filled prayer ministry, offering flowers, offering love and support. They have been able to help 1,000 women and counting who were about to walk into an abortion clinic to stop and to choose another path. In four years, they've saved the life, the lives of 1,000 babies. It's real. The idea of helping standing at an abortion clinic lovingly, prayerfully, before two weeks ago to me seemed radical. It seemed extreme. Throw me in the camp with the abortion 
clinic bombers from the 80s. Somehow that was the correlation. And no, there are people who are fighting for the lives of the unborn all the time, every day. Some don't do it really well, and we ask for grace for them, but so many are doing so with great sacrifice. So I want to encourage you, how can you advocate? How can you give? How can you promote life at whatever level possible? Fifty years ago, in the midst of this terrible segregation and the Jim Crow laws of the South and the horrible evils that were being done to the African-American community there, Martin Luther King rose up and he fought against racism for his people and eventually won great victories that gave African-Americans real freedom. Unfortunately, the unborn don't have anybody from among them who can rise up. No unborn person is going to be the next MLK and lead unborn babies to freedom and equal rights. They don't have the capacity to do so. The question I have, will you step up? Will you with me, seek to stand in the gap more vigorously, faithfully, sacrificially for these image-bearing people that God has designed with such specificity and, and uniqueness that they might know life rather than their demise. Let's pray.